Okay. Um, thank you very much for stalling. That was awesome. Um, so uh, I want to thank uh, Mary Lou, Terry, and Kyle for inviting me to speak today, um, and Dr. Hallett for inviting me to be on the program. Um, my group and I at the University of Utah have been working with uh, photophobia, blepharospasm, and FL41 for several years. And the purpose of my talk today is to sort of give you a quick summary of, um, of the work that we've been doing and kind of where we're headed off to in the future. Um, I also want you to know that, you know, as a, as a professor at the University of Utah, I don't get paid to do research. Um, I'm paid to see patients and do surgery. And so if you want to do a research project like this, you, the state's not going to give me any money. The department's not going to give me any money. As a matter of fact, they're losing money by having me doing research because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to, what they hired me to do, which was to see patients. So it's really through support from foundations like the Benign Essential Blepharospasm Research Foundation that allows this work to even get done. And uh, so I just want to thank those of you out there who support the BEBRF. And we're trying to use, you know, the money that we receive from the foundation judiciously and in an effort to better understand these diseases and make them better. So I just want you to know that the foundation has really been uh, critical to any of the research that I'm going to present to you now. Next slide. So photophobia is a term that we use for abnormal light sensitivity or abnormal intolerance to light. Um, there are multiple diseases of the eye, brain, and body that are associated with light sensitivity. The most common ones are migraine headaches, iritis, which is inflammation inside the eye, subarachnoid hemorrhage, that's bleeding inside the brain, and then, of course, blepharospasm. It turns out that almost all patients with blepharospasm are light sensitive, and um, that was the, one of the primary purposes of this research is to find out why patients are light sensitive, how the light sensitive affects their disease, and what we can do to make it better. Next slide. So a lot of you have heard about FL41 tinted lenses. For those of you who have not, that's sort of a rose-colored tint on your left, and I just put up a comparison of just some standard gray spectacles on the right for comparison. Next slide. So the thing that's unique about FL41 is its transmission spectrum, and, and what I've graphed here is uh, along the axis how much light gets through at different wavelengths down here. So the uh, short wavelengths like 350, 400, 450, that's sort of the blue, well, the, well, violet, then blue, then green kind of end of the spectrum, whereas the longer wavelengths on your right up towards 600 or 700 nanometers, that's sort of where red comes through. And the thing that's unique about FL41 is what it does right here. So this is the transmission of FL41 in blue. It dips down in the blue to green end of the spectrum, whereas the standard gray tinted lenses like I showed in the last picture, tend to transmit those frequencies. And so we think this is what is the magical thing about FL41. It's somehow that area of the spectrum, the blue-green area of the spectrum, that, that seems to be particularly irritating to people with these light-sensitive conditions. Next slide. So the first experiment that we did was a few summers ago, and that was to prove that blepharospasm patients really are more light-sensitive than people that don't have blepharospasm. Next slide. So what we did was we created this torture instrument where we put a very bright halogen stage light on a platform and we seated the patient in a slit lamp uh, apparatus just like we use in the uh, eye doctor's office. And then uh, a first year medical student sat back here and just gradually turned up the light until the patient said to stop. When they became uncomfortable, they, were, they said stop. He had a little light meter on the... Uh, on the light that, tell, that told him how much illuminance was being presented to the patient. He'd write down that number. And, you know, we did that on a bunch of people with migraine, a bunch of people with blepharospasm, and a bunch of people who had neither migraine nor blepharospasm. Next slide. And these data were presented in the American Journal of Ophthalmology in 2006 with me and my co-authors here, including Dr. Anderson, who will be speaking with you later this afternoon. Next slide. And one of the key data points that we presented in that paper, uh, so this little bar graph is uh, showing how much light different groups of patients were able to tolerate on average. So in black is migraine, the striped one here is migraine patients, and then the grayish one here on the right is uh, control patients. And what I've what we've uh, we've 
um, converted the light intensity into a logarithmic scale, so it's sort of a compressed scale. And so that means that the, the difference between 2 and 3 is like a factor of 10. And so what you see here is that patients with blepharospasm can tolerate less light than people, than the control subjects, and about the same amount of light as migraine subjects. So this was very good data showing that indeed blepharospasm, there is something different about blepharospasm patients that makes them, like migraine patients, more sensitive to light than people that don't have that disease. Next slide. So then the next step we wanted to do was to show, well, how does light sensitivity affect people in their, not only their disease, but sort of their activities of daily living? And 316 of you uh, attending an annual meeting of the BEBRF filled out questionnaires that were distributed by another medical student working with me. And then we um, compiled and analyzed those data. Next slide. <clears throat> and those were presented in the journal Neuroophthalmology two years ago uh, with this title. Next slide. And of the 360 patients that completed the questionnaires, 297 uh, said that they were light sensitive. That's 94%. Uh, just more than half of the respondents said that light sensitivity preceded their eyelid spasm. Nearly half said that they were light sensitive during spasms. A few people said they were light sensitive after spasms. Almost everybody said that, that strong light was unpleasant even when they weren't having spasms. And definitely everybody said that strong light was unpleasant during the spasm. A lot of people said that their um, light sensitivity was worse during a spasm than when they were spasm free. And a lot of people said that strong light could set them off and make them and cause them to go into spasm. Next slide. We also asked about activities of daily living and, the, and to the, the extent to which being light sensitive prevented them from doing things like reading, watching TV, watching movies, shopping, doing homework and housework. And we categorized them as no limitation, mild limitation, moderate or severe limitation. And, you know, so the thing, the takeaway message here is that blepharospasm is not just annoying because it makes your eyelids close and makes it hard to open, but it really, it, it goes into other aspects of your life. It affects your ability to do the things that you enjoy and, and, and housework and, and going to work. And so it's the point we were trying to make in this paper is that it's not just a movement disorder. It's a movement disorder that has a very uh, significant effect on many aspects of people's lives. Next slide. Okay, so that's all well and good. We know that blepharospasm patients are light sensitive and that it affects their activities of daily living. So what can we do to make them better? So we decided to take on a head-to-head -head test of these FL41 tinted glasses versus some standard gray tinted glasses. And we used a questionnaire instrument to assess whether or not people found one tint or the other tint more or less effective. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. So the testing protocol was after we enrolled people, they were randomized to either wear FL41 or gray first and they wore that over their standard spectacles for a period of two weeks. Then they went for two weeks without wearing any tint, and then they wore the other tint. So some people went FL41 to gray, and then some people went gray to FL41. That's just one of the little tricks that statistic statisticians have scientists use so that there's no bias uh, for, one, for using the first tint or the last tint that they wore. Next slide. So uh, we categorized improvement uh, in these different categories, reading, fluorescent light sensitivity, overall light sensitivity, blepharospasm frequency, and blepharospasm severity, we asked, okay, how many of the people wearing FL41 had a significant effect? So we, we, this was on a scale of uh, zero to five, and we were only counting people that said three, four, or five. And 31% said that wearing FL41 made reading significantly better 17% said it made fluorescent light sensitivity better and on down the line. 4% of um, uh, subjects said that gray made them significantly better. So that's a much smaller number. But a lot of people said that either one made them better. And then there were a few people who said, you know what, neither of these tints really helped. And so what we were able to conclude from here is that if, if tinted lenses are going to help, the thing to do is to put people in FL41 because that's going to capture not only these people who said that just FL41 helped, but also the people that said that both helped. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone. Next slide. 
So almost all uh, blepharospasm patients find that wearing tinted spectacles are helpful, and for the majority of subjects, FL41 lenses seem to be more helpful in terms of light sensitivity, spasm frequency, and spasm severity. Um, now this is a subjective experiment, right? We're just asking people, did you feel better? And we use a questionnaire instrument to assess whether or not people feel better um, according to different questions. So the criticism of this study was we need something objective. We need some way to measure this effect that, doesn't, that isn't based on just people's perceptions of how they feel, but something that shows that they really blink less. The other criticism of the study was that we didn't use, was that neither the subjects nor the doctors running the experiment were masked to which treatment the patient was receiving. So like in a lot of drug studies, for instance, some patients will get the study drug and some people get a placebo, something that looks like the study drug or maybe even tastes like the study drug, but there's nothing in it. And that's a way that they can say that, well, this was a real effect, not a placebo effect. So what we did in the next experiment, next slide, was we used EMG, electromyography. We monitored the activity of the orbicularis muscle that everybody's been talking about today to see if people were actually blinking less wearing these things. And we also had a fake FL41, an FL41 imposter in the study that was indistinguishable from the FL41 to both the investigators and the subjects. So we had the glasses marked so that you could tell which one was which, but the person conducting the experiment didn't know which one they were handing the patient, and the patient didn't know which one they were wearing. Next slide. And these data were just published last month in the journal Ophthalmology. Ophthalmology is the official journal of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. It's the most widely read journal amongst ophthalmologists. So it was really a big hit to get uh, these data published in ophthalmology with uh, here and all my collaborators. This required a lot of collaborators, right? We needed people to recruit subjects. We needed people that knew what they were doing with EMGs and statistical analysis. It was a big deal. Next slide. So here's the recording apparatus that we used. So we weren't using the torture apparatus like I showed you in the first experiment. We were putting on these little skin electrodes. There's a ground electrode under the ear. And, um, and then a monitoring electrode uh, just beneath the lower lid that's monitoring how much you're blinking, how long you're blinking, and how strongly you're blinking. So we're measuring three parameters in this, in this study. And what people were doing is that they were sitting in a, um, it was basically a hospital room that we borrowed from the hospital, uh, where we kept the ambient light at the same level, and we had patients read a book or magazine using their, using their standard reading spectacles for five minutes, and we monitored their blinking for five minutes, and at different parts in the experiment, we either had them wear no tint, FL41, gray, and the fake, the uh, FL41 imposter. The reason we kept the gray in the experiment is that that's what you can go out and buy. I mean, that's, you know, if you're going to go buy sunglasses at the drugstore, you're, that's what you're going to get. And so we wanted to compare it to something that's, that's similar to real life. Next slide. So here I've overlapped the spectral sensitivity of the three lenses, the FL41 in red, the gray lenses in black, and then the FL41 imposters in blue. So you can see that the, the imposter has a similar spectrum to FL41, but it does vary somewhat over the spectrum. Next slide. So here I'm comparing how FL41 compared to ROSE, or the, the fake FL41. And this is blink frequency in blinks per minute. And here we've got patients with blepharospasm, and here we have people who don't have blepharospasm. So you see that the blepharospasm people, when they're wearing no tint, do blink on average more than people that don't have it. Uh, Rose, the fake, fake FL41 really had no effect on their blink rate, but when they put on the FL41, they actually blinked about seven times a minute less on average compared to when they were wearing no tint. Now, the other thing that's interesting to me here is that the control patients blinked about the same through the whole experiment. It didn't matter what they were wearing. So that tells me that there's something peculiar about the spectrum of light that's irritating to patients with blepharospasm that just doesn't make any difference to people that don't have blepharospasm. So not only is this 
an important effect. It's also telling us something about why people with blepharospasm are light sensitive, that there's something intrinsically different about the way their brain processes light. Next slide. Uh, now, we also monitored blink duration, in other words, how long your eye stays closed, and we found that the different tints didn't have any significant influence on blink duration. When we compared FL41 to the fake FL41 imposter, we did find that um, FL41 reduced blink force, in other words, how strongly, how tightly people contracted their orbicularis muscle uh, compared to the imposter. And again, no, there's a trend here. You know, it seemed like control patients did blink a little bit less strongly with FL41, but it was not statistically significant. Next slide. Here we put FL41 against the gray tinted lenses. Again, people with FL41 blinked less frequently and patients without blepharospasm didn't really make any difference. Next slide. And it turned out that when comparing FL41 in gray, there was no, again, no significant change in blink duration, and in this case, no significant uh, change in blink force. So we took that, those subjective data, you know, the data from the questionnaire study where we had people wear gray or FL41 for two weeks, combined it with the electromyographic study, which was objective evidence that this really does work, and we put it together in this single publication. So from uh, these experiments that we've run over the last several years, we conclude that blepharospasm patients really are more light sensitive than control patients. They suffer significant disabilities as a result of their light sensitivity, and that FL41 has some magical property about it that helps make these symptoms better. Next slide. I also want to, uh, for those of you who are thinking that, gee, I want to get some of this FL41 stuff, it's not super widely available because there's just not a lot of information out there, and a lot of optical shops just simply don't carry it. Carry it. Um, and what we did here is we actually went out and just asked different optical shops around Salt Lake City to give us some FL41, and we threw them through a, a spectral analyzer and found that there was an immense amount of variability in the quality of the FL41 we received. So you really want to get your FL41 from a reliable supplier. So the three things that I, uh, suppliers that I recommend, there's um, Brain Power Incorporated, which I think is in, I get them mixed up. There's Brain Power Incorporated, BPI, and there is uh, Phantom Labs. One of them's in Florida and one of them's in California. And then at the Moran Eye Center in Salt Lake City, we also uh, carry the tent and we actually test it in a spectral analyzer to make sure it's the right stuff. And so you can either have the optical shop you work with obtain the tint from BPI or Phantom Labs, or you can, what a lot of people do is they mail their spectacles to the Moran Eye Center in Salt Lake City. We tint them for the patient and then ship them out, uh, ship them back.